Ladies and gentlemen, good morning to you and welcome to YouGov's COVID-19 Consumer Monitor Update. My name is William Ulstein. I am a Commercial Director at YouGov, um, working globally across our business. I'm delighted to be joined today by uh, Bianca Brun, our CEO of Mainland Europe. Good morning, Bianca. Good morning, Will, and uh, thank you. Good morning to everyone on this call, and thank you for joining today's session. Um, as Will just said, my name is Bianca Brun, and I'm responsible for our operations in mainland Europe. Um, I am delighted to have this opportunity today to update you uh, with some great data and insights from our COVID-19 monitor and the new launch of our economic recovery module. So back to you, Will. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Bianca. So. Um, let's get on um, and run through uh, our update, just to give you an overview of what we will talk about this morning. First of all, I'm going to talk a little bit about YouGov's work on COVID-19 to date and our ultimate mission, which is about serving the public good. I'm then going to pass over to Bianca, who's going to walk through our insights collected from our consumer monitor and some of the early data that we've seen collected in the UK, US and Germany on our economic recovery monitor. The economic recovery will be launched um, globally, but we're giving you a sneak peek of the data that we've collected to date. I'm then going to come back at the end um, with and talk about where we're going next and what are the future developments for YouGov's COVID-19 work. And we'll, of course, open this up to questions at the end. And we would love to hear from all of you. Um, in order to manage questions within Zoom here, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the platform, you will find a chat function. If you could please, as we go, um, jot your questions down in there. Um, there is a, a team behind um, Bianca and myself that's also looking at those questions. So we will try and get round to answering as many of those as possible. Um, if you want to ask that question publicly, then please do. Um, if you want to also send that privately um, to either Bianca or myself, you have that ability within the chat function. So let me talk a little bit about what YouGov is doing in relation to COVID-19. Our mission as dictated by our CEO, is very much one of serving the public good. And what do we mean by this? We mean that that is giving everybody that wants to the opportunity to contribute to the discussion, contribute to the data that is being collected, and crucially, um, delivering that data to those around the world that can make a difference. And I'll talk a little bit about those organizations that we are working with and um, uh, uh, as we go. So who have we partnered with um, in relation to our work? YouGov is working with the Institute of Global Health Innovation at Imperial College London. Imperial College London is one of the world's leading centers in epidemiology and their work has been um, influencing strategy of several governments around the world, um, of course influencing um, the UK government, but their work has also been used um, more broadly um, by them. What we are doing with Imperial is we have set out um, a whole new survey that is looking at tracking behavioural data. This is behavioural data that policymakers um, and health officials around the world, including the World Health Organization, are using to inform strategy. We've created a dashboard um, that is open source and available um, at, uh, at the link that I've provided in this deck. And that is updating on a weekly basis. It's tracking 29 countries around the world with about 30,000 surveys per week. We've also, for the first time, made uh, YouGov data um, open source 
for our behavioural work that is going into um, the uh, informing public health organisations. And that is available at GitHub. Uh, for those of you that use that, you can download our raw data from there. Um, but how are, how are the public health organisations using our data? Well, in the scientific community, they're known as CAP studies, knowledge, attitude and behaviour studies. And what this is informing policymakers and communicators of is levels of awareness, fear, trust and readiness of the population to comply with guidance or advice issued by government. And like any good marketeer um, that is trying to affect change in behaviour, um, really what governments and policymakers need to do is deeply understand uh, the population that they are trying to affect. So that they can better develop strategies that are relevant, that are timely, so that they are putting in the right practice at the right time. So for example, um, our data is uh, being used to inform the exit strategy of many governments from lockdown situations. Crucially, it's making sure that the um, policies that they're putting out are actionable um, and understandable by the population. There is no point in putting out communication talking about social distancing, for example, if nobody understands exactly what social distancing is. So, we're providing that level of data um, to inform strategy so that they can use that and deploy that insight to effect meaningful behavioural change with ethical nudge um, uh, solutions. In terms of what that data covers, and everyone can explore it in GitHub if they wish, um, it covers symptoms, um, testing, or willingness of people to test, um, self-isolation practices, um, uh, what people are doing when leaving their home, the number of people that they're coming into contact with, um, washing hands um, and the extent of compliance. Um, and as I said, that's available in 29 countries. Um, as an example of the type of um, very, very high level output um, that we're creating in this regard, um, an example on the right is uh, just a flash briefing that we've been creating um, for various community, scientific communities, um, showing what the situation is in Sweden, as an example. But that's not where YouGov is stopping in terms of release of its data. We are also publishing on our website and through media partnerships um, our own public data. Um, we are continuously updating this data on our website with interactive charts, so looking at all of the countries that we are tracking. Um, you can narrow that down to region, you can narrow that down to specific countries. Um, the two examples that I've given on screen there are um, rather cluttered, um, I admit, but I just wanted to show the, uh, the, the number and the breadth of the data that we are collecting. On there at the moment, on our website, uh, which you will find at yougov.com forward slash free COVID-19 tracker, um, you will find selection of the data that we are putting out there. Um, and that tends to cover um, fears, behaviours, support for government, um, uh, but also um, what we are now developing is certain elements of our economic recovery tracker that will be public data so that you can see the impact on people's personal finances. In terms of what our public data rather than our scientific data covers, there we're looking at about 27 markets, um, although we'll always add more um, if there is sufficient client demand. And that kind of uh, so far is built on a base of over 400,000 surveys and that number is climbing every single week. For those clients that subscribe to our data products, so brand index and profiles, and I know there are many of them on this call, what we've also done is uh, used our COVID-19 uh, tracking data and uh, injected that into brand index and profiles 
to give you greater value, to allow you to understand the movements of brand in relation to particular audiences, but also so that in profiles you can more deeply understand um, how uh, certain elements or certain audiences um, are behaving, thinking and feeling. If you are a subscriber and do need help um, identifying or finding these variables in profiles, please do contact your local account team. If you are interested um, in uh, gaining a subscription, then please contact um, your local YouGov office. Let me just talk about the data that Bianca is going to talk through in a minute. And this is very much from our commercial solutions. Um, we're offering these commercial solutions. Um, uh, in particular, it's called the COVID-19 Consumer Monitor, and that goes beyond and above our public data and offers greater depth. We have priced this very competitively and syndicated the data set in order to make sure that we are able to um, deliver this to as many clients as we possibly can and the costs that we are charging are going towards helping us fund the huge amount of work we are doing with public health organizations. In terms of the way that data is delivered, it is delivered by our, our very powerful analytics platform called Crunch and clients buy into our tracking data for a period of eight weeks at a time. The economic recovery questions have been added um, in the last week or so um, for most markets and will be coming online and available to clients from next week. Um, these are additional questions that we've added to the consumer monitor that clients can also buy into. Let me talk about the types of data that we are collecting in that consumer monitor. And for those of you that um, were interested, looked at the data or even subscribed to the data in our first block of eight weeks, um, we have evolved the question set. So for example, in our first block of eight weeks, we asked level, we asked questions such as, are you aware of COVID-19 or coronavirus? Now that the uh, pandemic has reached around the world, that question, um, or the answer to that question is almost 100%. And so we've retired that question because it's not useful anymore. What we've done is allowed us to free up space in our survey to ask a different type of question that is more appropriate to the current situation. And these questions will run for the next period of eight weeks um, that period of eight weeks started on Monday um, and will run to the 26th of June, at which point we will look to um, develop block three, our third uh, block of eight weeks, and we will again evolve the questionnaire. Um, keep tuning into our webinars to find out how we are going to evolve that data. But in broad terms, our Consumer Monitor covers three areas. So it is around levels of concern in the new data um, that we will be publishing. Um, so perceptions of the situation globally, is it getting better or worse? Um, uh, how is government handling the situation? Do people have sufficient information? A new question um, that will be uh, um, uh, running this week is around trust um, and trust in three areas. Um, in government, in the media, and in healthcare. That was as a response to client feedback, so we very much welcome your feedback on this. Um, and we're also looking at uh, people's travel plans and how they um, intend to change. Um, we're keeping um, uh, questions around spend. Um, clients found those particularly useful, um, similarly for media consumption. In our economic recovery questions, um, we are looking again at three broad areas. People's confidence and outlook. By confidence, what I'm talking about is how is their current household financial situation? Are they struggling to keep their head above water? Or are they comfortable financially um, in their current situation? And what is their projection 
or perception of how that will change over the next 12 months. We also look at people's employment. Um, what has happened to them personally, um, whether they have been furloughed, whether they have uh, had their hours reduced, whether they've been made redundant, um, or the, you know, the, the positive and the flip side of that, which is have they had their hours extended, um, et cetera. Um, the final section also looks at changing consumer habits. So we're, what we're looking at is what does the new consumer look like on the other side of this pandemic? As people come out of lockdown, have they learnt new behaviours that are likely to be sticky? So, for example, um, will people use cash as a medium for transactions less? Now that people have been, or office workers have been working from home, well, do they enjoy that? Are they very keen to rush back to the office? Um, or do they actually enjoy some of the work-life balance that working from home gives them? So those types of questions um, we are also exploring. And some of this data Bianca will present um, for the UK, Germany and the US um, because we've already run those. Um, for the rest of Europe, we're collecting data on this at the moment um, and that will be available um, to subscribers from next week. Um, uh, I think I've talked um, about timing throughout this, uh, um, the, those question areas, so I won't dwell on this and we'll get to uh, Bianca, who's the main event, um, as quickly as possible. But just to reiterate, um, we are now entering our second eight week block um, uh, and, uh, and upgrading our question set. Um, block two does run from uh, Monday until the 26th of June. Um, and what we are doing for those of you that are global subscribers, um, we're bringing all of our markets into the same timeline. We did start tracking in APAC three weeks earlier than we did the rest of the world. Um, we're bringing APAC into line so that everything is nice and neat for our clients. But um, that's more than enough of me. Um, let's get on to uh, what you've really tuned in for, um, and that is listening to Bianca sharing the insights that we've collected from Europe to date. Bianca. Thanks, Will. A uh, very nice introduction there. Um, and I just want to say, because I can see quite a few sort of asking whether we're going to make the slides available to you afterwards. So we are indeed. Um, so just making sure I can see that Lisa have already responded to you on the chat, but just to make sure that you don't need to sit and take loads of notes or pictures here while, uh, while I talk. Um, so uh, let's dive into the European data that um, Will have sort of already sort of given you uh, a little bit of an introduction to. Um, I'm just going to do a quick um, um, sort of note on methodology. Uh, so we've collected data every week since March 12. And as you can see here, we are collecting the data in weekly waves with 2000 interviews every week in Germany and the UK respectively, uh, 250 interviews per country for all of the Nordic countries every week and a thousand interviews per week for the rest of the countries. Now, as you can see here, uh, we will today present you with data from seven waves. Uh, first wave of data collection ran from March 12 to 18 um, to the seventh and last uh, wave that ran from April 23 to 28. And as you can see here, there is an eighth wave uh, happening right now, uh, are completing uh, today and the data will be available and analyzed as we speak. So let's dive in. So, as we discussed uh, during the last webinar, and I can see that some of you, uh, uh, I'm delighted to see, also joined our last webinar. Um, and here we discussed that we see uh, our national leaders across Europe appeal to very different emotions, actually ranging from this personal responsibility, solidarity, uh, national pathos, and martial war calls. Um, and we want to continuously keep this in mind as we look through uh, the data today. So Conte, Merkel, uh, Ferguson uh, have appealed to solidarity and responsibility and Macron and Johnson have both initially at least been uh, using more sort of war related language, uh, but of course also appealed to, to solidarity. Now, all the countries have moved to the next phases of handling the crisis. So all with different lockdown strategies and now with different reopening strategies. 
So uh, the reopening strategies, if we move to the next slide, um, we are, are really sort of ranging from, if we sort of look at Italy, for example, where Conta has uh, eased restrictions from Monday uh, this week, uh, where small businesses and factories are reopening and more than 4 million people are actually expected to return to work and over to uh, an, another strategy in Denmark where focus initially have been uh, on opening schools and nurseries and kindergartens to ensure that every uh, or the very large part of the workforce with small children uh, would be able to, to return to work and become productive again. Uh, and Norway um, has really followed a similar strategy to Denmark. Now, Germany is starting to ease restrictions. Um, Spain has eased restrictions just lightly. Uh, France is expected to do so from, from Monday, uh, May 11th. Um, and the UK has not yet relaxed restrictions, but uh, is also making plans for returning to work. And I think Will was just saying this morning, there's a planned announcement for Sunday this week uh, on the reopening in the UK. So it is really important context to have as we dive into the data, because what we see is that we see some small but positive signs on consumer behavior as soon as the countries start to, to reopen. Um, so let's dive into the data. Uh, so first we look at our trust in the system uh, and the sense of threat from COVID-19. So this first slide look at, at the level of fear. And I just want to make a short introduction to the colors here uh, for the different countries because we'll be using the same color uh, on the coming slides. Um, and just uh, for everybody to follow here on the horizontal axis, you see the seven waves of data collection. Um, and the lines show you the percentage of people saying that they are very or fairly scared of contracting uh, the coronavirus. So we have Denmark in light pink uh, placed in the middle of this chart, so in the 40 to 50 range, uh, so the medium fear level. And then we have Finland in the light purple. Now, Finland started uh, off being quite relaxed and then got quite concerned. Um, that was around end of March when they closed down uh, the region that is surrounding Helsinki. Uh, but they are now safely back to their usual cool, calm and collected state of mind, which is great to see. Um, and we have France in the dark purple, uh, the country uh, increasing the most actually during the initial waves uh, with 70% of the French people end of March saying that they are fairly or very uh, scared of contracting the virus. And that has now dropped, as you can see, to 60% end of April. You have Germany in the dark green, relatively stable on the medium fear level. And you have Italy in red uh, at the top of the chart. Um, have continuously been the country with the highest level of fear. And you have Norway in the light blue, um, Spain in the darker blue line, and Sweden in the black. Um, started at the bottom of the chart, as you can see, with the lowest level of fear during the initial wave, um, but with a significant jump sort of early April. And that was where the situation seemed to be getting worse in Sweden. Uh, and there were stories in the news about military building temporary hospitals. And it was also around the period uh, leading up to Easter, uh, where there was a lot of uncertainty about whether or not it would be safe to travel around the country during the holidays. Um, however, as you can see, after this point, Sweden has reached a different level of fear uh, for the following waves. And finally, we have the UK in dark pink, uh, which uh, a little bit like France showed a significant increase over the first three waves, uh, but then a more stable but still high level of fear for the following waves. Now, um, in my mind, the key takeaway from this slide is really that most countries are getting used to the situation. We're seeing some level of normalization um, and we don't see as significant increases in April in the level of fear as we did in March, um, except for a few outliers like Sweden and Finland. Now, let's move to the next slide uh, where we look at uh, satisfaction with the government across the region. And here again, uh, we see more stabilization from end of March and beginning of April. And this is interesting as all countries are, of course, experiencing a lot of debate about uh, the appropriate opening strategy to apply. But as you can see, it's not really changing the picture massively. Um, and we're still seeing France and Spain at the bottom of this chart. 
Uh, they are far from uh, satisfied with the government's handling of the crisis. Um, <clears throat> And Denmark at the top of the chart, uh, closely now followed by Norway, sort of from early April. And Sweden is clearly continuously evaluating whether or not their government is applying the right strategy. And that's, of course, given that it's a quite different uh, strategy to most other uh, countries in EU. And as they continuously observe that the situation is kept under control, they also feel more and more confident about the government strategy. Now, I noted last time uh, we did the webinar, uh, when we were reviewing the data from the initial three waves, uh, that more visibility, uh, or the more visibility in communication from the leader, the higher the satisfaction. And we can see this um, was initially true for Germany and Merkel, uh, with her initially being quite invisible and then moving to high visibility and lots of communication. Um, and we now also see this even more actually for Norway, where Solberg uh, was quite anom on an anonymous in the beginning, uh, but has then continuously demonstrated her leadership throughout the crisis, which is clearly paying off in terms of recognition from the Norwegian people. And this is, of course, for all of us to remember, not just for our government leaders, that high visibility, lots of communication gets rewarded. And last time we had a gentleman ask uh, about the US specifically and the satisfaction with the government. So I thought it would be helpful uh, with the following chart uh, this time, where you can see uh, the country rankings in terms of satisfaction with the government's handling of the crisis. Um, and as you can see here, uh, the Americans have among the lowest level of positive sentiment towards the way uh, their government has handled the situation. Uh, only just slightly above Spain and France, the two European countries in the bottom of the table. Um, and I think probably the politically, politically right thing to do is just to leave out any further comments uh, on that and move on to the next slide, please. Now we look at the confidence in the healthcare system where the most noteworthy country is really Spain. Um, as Spain remains super confident in the healthcare system, and that is despite their significant dissatisfaction with the government's handling of the crisis. So as mentioned previously, this may be less about the confidence in the system and much more about the Spanish people's confidence in the amazing and brave healthcare workers. Um, but as you can see, France, on the other hand, uh, do not separate those two things. And as you saw before, they are not satisfied with the government and they do not have confidence in the healthcare system. Um, the biggest increases for, uh, from the first wave to the last wave, uh, we see in Germany and Norway and Sweden, and we actually see increases in confidence by more than 20%. And Sweden came from the absolute lowest confidence level um, around mid-March. Uh, mid and they were generally worried about the overall strategy applied by the government. Uh, but as their satisfaction with the government has increased, so has their confidence in the healthcare system. Uh, of course, after that drop early April, as explained previously. Now, all of these slides tell you what emotional state of mind you are finding the different countries. And uh, you really want to be mindful uh, of this in any communication uh, with any of these countries, of course. So now we dive into how the restrictions are impacting consumer behavior. So looking at our screen time, which is always interesting to take a look at, so traditional TV versus on demand, uh, we're seeing that the gap between the two is really narrowing in some countries. Um, we're comparing here the data uh, end of March uh, results with the end of April results. Um, and there is definitely a level of normalization happening here uh, where we, when the crisis started, we were constantly satisfying our excessive appetite for news to keep updated on the situation. And now we're seeing um, some of these very high levels for watching more TV coming down. Finland, Sweden and the UK have increased their on-demand consumption, consumption since end of March. Um, and just showing that people continue to have more time uh, these days um, as they've caught back on social engagements and, and other things. And this trend is, of course, something to keep an eye on in relation to where you want to put your advertising spend. Now we look at 
in-store uh, spend. And as you can see, more than 40% say that they have decreased their in-store spend as a result of the restrictions and lockdown. Uh, and this number is actually as high as 50 to 60% in Spain, UK and France. Um, the good news here, um, as far as I'm concerned, is that we see immediate positive impact of even small reopening initiatives. So as an example, Denmark, uh, they went from 41% uh, mid-April to 33% uh, during this last wave. Um, and that has come uh, in connection with restrictions are released uh, or eased, uh, and a number of stores are slowly but surely reopening. So watch out for this um, as more and more countries are reopening. And let's just take a quick look at the online spend as well, because our online spend has also decreased, uh, though not as much as our in-store spend. So Spain, UK and France, again, recorded the highest percentage of people saying that they have decreased their online spend um, as a result of the restrictions and lockdown. And actually only Germany remain uh, below 10% throughout uh, this tracking period. Now, let's shift mode a bit and look at some exciting data from our uh, new recovery module. Um, and as uh, Will sort of alluded to in the beginning, uh, we are collecting data for uh, most countries uh, right now. So the data is ticking in as we speak. Uh, however, we will be able to give you a sneak peek into results from Germany and the UK and the US. So we start looking at uh, concerns and first, like what people are mostly concerned about in relation to the current crisis. And as you can see, there is general agreement between the three countries that the biggest concern is the impact on local businesses. Uh, of course, as you can see here, closely followed by the concern around a global recession. Uh, and as you can see, we see that the Americans are more concerned than the Germans and the Brits about the potential impact on their ability to pay their bills, the rent, uh, mortgages. And this is really not surprisingly given um, US labor laws and uh, security in case of unemployment, of course. Uh, the next slide, uh, we're looking at lifestyle impact. And we see that people in all three countries plan to support local businesses much more. Um, it is somewhat contradictory uh, to the fact that many, as you can see here, especially Americans, also intend to make more use of online shopping. Uh, but I do find it interesting to see the expectation that more people plan to support local businesses. And that leads uh, to a relevant question of whether we will see much more advertising for locally produced products. Um, which has a high risk of being perceived as nationalistic, uh, which is, of course, something we don't like in the EU. Um, so it is about finding that right balance for your communication. And here, not surprisingly, uh, given the weather in the UK, uh, especially the Brits are looking forward to going on holiday overseas again. Uh, on the next slide, we take a quick look at the financial impact on households. And we see that more than 40% of the Brits and the Americans have reduced their non-essential expenses. Um, however, indeed also positive to see that uh, a very high proportion of both Brits, uh, Americans, and especially uh, the Germans haven't made any changes to their household financials in the past month. Um, the next slide, we look at property value. And this is of course always, um, uh, something we look at, the development of property prices is a key indicator uh, for the economic situation in general. And as you can see, the Brits are particularly concerned uh, with half of the people expecting the value of properties in the neighborhood to decrease, to decrease uh, 12 months from now. The Germans, but also the Americans, are more confident in the long-term development uh, of the property prices. And then finally, uh, the last slide that I will go through, uh, we look at how people think their household's financial situation will change 12 months from now. And here we see that between 30 and 40% of those surveyed in all countries fear that the financial situation in the household will deteriorate. 
Now, this is offset, especially in Germany, by a large proportion of people who assume no change in the long term. Uh, only in the US there is a large proportion of optimists. Um, it will be better. And actually, when we dive into the data, this optimism is mainly driven by Trump voters, uh, as 41% of the 2016 Trump voters uh, think the financial situation will be better, and only 21% of the 2016 Clinton voters think it will be better. And um, just on a note, 42% uh, of the 2016 Clinton voters think it will get worse. And on that note, uh, I will conclude uh, my part of the presentation and hand back to you, Will. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Bianca. Really, really interesting uh, insights there. Um, and I do note, as a Brit, um, the, uh, the jive against our British weather. Um, but uh, I can tell you now, um, we, uh, we, we personally can't wait to get out and, uh, and go on holiday. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, what is next. What's next for us? Um, what's next for you um, as clients? Um, so um, over the next coming weeks, we are going to have um, ex extend our webinar series. Um, to give you some um, added insights, um, to give you um, uh, some added value from what we are doing here at YouGov. Um, the first one that I'm really excited to talk about that will be in, in two weeks time is we're going to have an update on science. So we're, we are going to be joined by Sarah Jones, who's a research fellow at Imperial College London. Uh, and her and Gavin Ellison, who runs our public um, uh, our, our public um, organisation uh, trackers, um, will be talking about the behavioural data that I described earlier. So this is the same data that policymakers and governments are using to stop the spread of COVID-19. And they're going to give you a glimpse into what data the scientists are looking at and how they're thinking. So it's a, it's a rare opportunity, I'm quite excited about the content for this one, um, to really get an inside line on, uh, on that. And given the timing of this, it is highly likely um, that many European countries will be out of lockdown or some form of uh, lockdown at that time. Um, uh, right on the, uh, the, on the, the pivot point of decision making of um, have we gone too fast, too early in terms of easing restrictions? Are we not going fast enough to kickstart the economy? So that will be the, uh, that will be the big balancing equation that we will be, uh, we will be looking at. Um, a couple of weeks after that, what we're going to bring you is um, global insights and narratives from YouGov's connected data. So from our brand index survey, where we're tracking over 10,000 brands across 41 markets. What we can tell you is which brands have performed well and which brands have not performed so well. There are some, uh, some heroes and villains out there, I can tell you. Um, some brands that have openly defied government advice um, and they've been punished for it um, in terms of uh, their perception, their reputation, um, and their sales pipeline. There are other brands that have diverted resources, time, uh, equipment, and manufacturing capabilities to support COVID-19. Those brands have done particularly well. Um, so we'll be looking at that. We'll be looking at um, our pipeline data. So looking at, ca at a category level, um, which categories are doing particularly well, um, which categories are doing particularly badly. Um, it will be no surprise for you to understand that um, the transport sector is, uh, um, is in deep um, trouble and under pressure, um, uh, along with uh, uh, hotels um, and anything related to international travel. Um, uh, but there are other winners and losers on a category level that are very, very interesting. Um, to look at. And we'll also be looking at what particular audiences marketeers will find most valuable um, uh, as we emerge from this crisis. 
Um, the other thing to watch out for is more public data. Um, so as we develop our trackers, as we um, work more, even more closely with public health organisations, we will be releasing more of our data into the public domain. Um, there is always going to be a fine line between what is public um, and that that our clients are paying for. Um, we obviously wouldn't um, uh, release all of our data um, that uh, the clients are paying for. Um, that would be uh, um, uh, not good um, from our point of view. Um, anyway, um, enough of me. Um, let's get on to you and your questions. So I can see that some are coming in. Um, and please do use the chat function um, in order to post questions to us. Um, but Bianca has been looking at those. Um, so Bianca, is there anything that you found particularly interesting? Um, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Well, yeah, that lots of interesting questions, guys. So thanks for keep them coming. Um, so we have a question on what happened in France in the week after March uh, 19. So that sort of after the three waves here, um, there is this huge drop in satisfaction and uh, satisfaction with the government. And really, um, it was actually just around this period that lots of restrictions were put in place in France. And I guess we're all a little bit, uh, it was hard for, for everyone to accept uh, those kind of restrictions, uh, but, but clearly that was something uh, also potentially in the way that it was communicated uh, that uh, was not sort of taken well by, uh, by the, the, the French people in general. Um, we also have a question about what, uh, what to do. Uh, if you have a question that you would like to uh, uh, have added, and that is absolutely possible uh, to add questions. So you can always uh, contact your, your local YouGov representative and uh, we can add any additional questions that you might find uh, that we're not covering that you find is, uh, is highly relevant. Um, so just looking further down, Will, if there's something that you have picked up, feel free to. So there's a, uh, there's, again, there's a couple of questions coming in around, um, will you share this presentation afterwards? Um, uh, the short answer to that is absolutely, yes, we will. Um, uh, the presentation will be available. We will also send a link um, to everyone that attended this webinar today, um, uh, both to the slides and a recording um, of this webinar as well. Um, uh, just to expand also on the um, way that clients are able to customise um, our uh, COVID-19 monitor. Around the world, we have um, a, a significant number of clients that are subscribing to this data, including, for example, um, some of the big global media entities, um, uh, media agencies, um, some of the big Silicon Valley giants um, that are subscribing to this data. Um, governments, uh, of course, in some instances, um, and they are able to tailor um, the questions uh, to a certain degree. Um, we're offering the ability to ask bespoke questions that can be tagged onto the tracker. There is, however, um, if only a finite amount of space um, that we can have, so it really is sold on a um, uh, first come, first serve basis. Um, so if you are keen on customization, um, as one of these questions suggests, um, then please do speak to your local office sooner rather than later. Bianca, uh, yeah. anything else that you can tell Yeah, me? just actually adding, because I think uh, the, the, the questions around France sort of sparked a bit more um, sort of diving into to, to France in general. And um, uh, we had a question around whether we generally see um, sort of lower uh, government satisfaction in France. And actually, um, just to comment on that, our surveys um, sort of generally suggest that government satisfaction in France seems to be uh, lower than in other European countries. But um, I think here we're seeing uh, very low numbers for France. So um, just a little bit of additional context on that one. Absolutely. I think whenever you look at global data, um, you always have to take into account 
um, cultural differences and cultural sensitivities. Um, we have tried as far as we possibly can across all of our markets to standardize questions. However, there always will be requirement for some local tailoring. Um, uh, but if you look, if you refer back to that um, slide that Bianca put up on um, satisfaction with government handling of the crisis, um, those at the top, India uh, and Vietnam, um, what you tend to see there is a cultural, um, uh, cultural agreement um, with uh, the state. Um, uh, we, uh, th there are some markets missing from that league table, however, um, you can't actually ask um, satisfaction with government handling in China. Um, uh, that's, uh, so we don't ask that. Um, but you do always have to take into consideration cultural as well as contextual um, observations. And just um, got another question around um, sort of other countries available uh, and uh, whether we, for instance, have uh, markets like Austria covered. And actually, Austria is one of the countries that we have uh, more recently added together with Switzerland, um, Turkey, a couple of other countries. Um, so there are actually 26 countries in total that we're covering, but there are um, some that are being uh, added here for the next uh, uh, block um, we'll sort of introduce that we're sort of out there with the next uh, eight week block and uh, there is a more uh, Poland as well I think in uh, in block two um, so there are quite a few uh, additional markets that are coming. Fantastic. Um, I think that's got us to the end of the questions. I will put a, a last call out. Um, if there are any further questions, then please do put them in the chat channel now. Um, if you do require any further information about the work that YouGov is doing, our public data, or indeed you're interested in our, uh, subscribing to our tracker, then please do contact your local uh, account team or your local office in the first instance. Um, if you're unsure of where to go, there is a global email address that you can contact. It is info at yougov.com. Um, that is monitored around the clock um, by teams from Sydney to LA. So um, please do uh, use that um, as well to get in contact with us. Um, if there are no more questions, um, then, uh, then we'll sign off. Um, I'll hand over to uh, Bianca just to uh, uh, say good day. But from me, um, thank you very much for listening. Um, and I hope you have a wonderful afternoon and stay safe. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks for listening. And yes, please do stay safe. Thank you.